So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session of our GAT Digital Conference. I'm honored to introduce this afternoon with us, um, our guest speaker, uh, John Danner, who I'm going to introduce shortly. So I think you had a very full and interesting morning uh, today in uh, uh, GAT Digital. Um, and um, um, I introduce myself. My name is Marta Rocchi. I'm uh, assistant professor in uh, corporate governance and business ethics uh, in DCU Business School here in Dublin. And um, I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon for this session. So during the GAT Digital Conference, uh, we've been exploring uh, like a different range of topics related to business, to leadership, to entrepreneurship, and um, especially uh, focusing on how the um, digitalization is transforming the way business uh, works, is set, um, and the way um, through which the digital technologies are actually allowing business to achieve their goals. So um, this afternoon in particular, we have um, uh, a very interesting speaker, uh, who is John Danner, uh, who I'm welcoming uh, uh, here with us today. So John, um, is uh, currently affiliated with the, um, the Berkeley University in California, with the business school in particular, and is author of, um, uh, in particular, uh, two uh, very uh, two books, um, "Built for Growth" and the other F World Words. Uh, and we, I will actually, I anticipate John, <laughs> that I will actually ask you to talk about uh, your books later on during the Q and A, and. Um, Today, he will be talking about the digital imperative, so the new DNA for insurgents and inc incumbents like. So uh, I just uh, also would like to welcome our audience and um, we're happy to receive questions for John and uh, you, you can just submit them through the Q&A as the chat is uh, disabled. Uh, so um, please use the Q&A if you want to interact with John and we will take your questions uh, towards the end. So. Uh, I don't want to keep the <laughs> my mic on uh, more, and I just leave uh, to John for uh, like his presentation. And thank you again for accepting our invitation. Thanks so much, Marta. I, I appreciate it. Let me uh, tempt the Zoom gods and see if I can share my screen here. Hopefully, you should be able to see. If yes, I can we get... are. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't see one another because I, I have no idea what the mix of our audience is between incumbents, you know, folks that represent established organizations, businesses, government agencies, nonprofits, or whatever, um, insurgents, uh, the startups that are trying to put all those other folks out of business uh, one way or another, sooner rather than later, presumably, or if you're an interested bystander to this whole digital world that we are in the middle of. Um, so I apologize for missing the target if I'm off for one or another of these audiences, but uh, I'll do my best. You know, it's probably heresy, but here I am invited to give a talk in a conference called Get Digital, and uh, I'm actually going to go analog, uh, but what I really mean is I'm going to go with a lot of analogies, uh, because I tend to think in analogies and metaphors from time to time. So I've given you a kind of breadcrumb trail through my presentation. I'm going to give you a baker's dozen, 13 analogies through the course of my conversation. So you'll know kind of when we're getting close to the end just by tracking the number of analogies that I share with you. So let's get started. The most important one, I think, is that I'm going to suggest that we look at this issue of digitization and identity as almost a DNA strand. They are two strands interconnected with one another in a very, very powerful and new way, yet to be discovered in all of its particulars. I think it's critical to understand how this new DNA works to create value in changing markets and changing societies. But it also has a lot to do with how you protect value. And in that sense, it works both offensively and defensively. Offensively, if you're trying to launch a business, 
you've got to be thinking about the digital strategy more even than strategy. It's the digital identity. And from a defensive point of view, if you're not understanding the power and potential of the digital revolution, you are leaving yourself unnecessarily valuable, to, vulnerable to losing the value you've spent so much time and money creating in the first place. Now, just like the DNA strands, there are linkages that tie these two strands together, identity and digitization, purpose, values, culture, your vision, your strategy, leadership, structure. It affects virtually every dimension of an organization. And I use the term identity advisedly because I think it is that core. It has a lot to do with how we see ourselves, how we project ourselves into markets, the kind of internal environment that we want to project for our employees, and perhaps most importantly, the kind of relationship that we want to create and sustain with the customers on whom we depend. Now, I'm in the from to business. I think most of us in the audience are probably in the from to business. We're all trying to get either ourselves or our teams or our organizations from where they are today to hopefully someplace better, brighter, bigger, faster, more profitable tomorrow. Now, I get a chance to do that in about four different ways. I teach, I get a chance to do a fair amount of speaking around the world, I do a lot of consulting, and when I get time, I try to write some of those ideas down. I get the rare privilege of teaching at some of the finest universities in the world. I teach at the University of California Berkeley Business School. I also teach every year at Princeton University, uh, usually a couple of times a year at the Yale School of Business as well, and a number of other programs. I speak a lot. Uh, corporate events, professional conferences, and things like that, I get a chance to advise a lot of organizations from emerging startups to global companies trying to figure out how they cope with these new realities and writing. Um, when teaching, I get a chance to have a kind of eyewitness um, on a lot of wonderful new developments. Uh, one of the businesses that launched the whole crowdfunding revolution, which is now $100 billion plus global industry, uh, Indiegogo, started in one of my classes at Berkeley. Um, and I had a chance to see how a digitally native idea can begin to form, along with others, a very powerful force that is changing the face of how businesses and other projects get funded globally. I have a chance to write. This is my colleague, Mark Coopersmith, who I wrote our book called The Other F Word, How Smart Leaders, Teams, and Entrepreneurs Put Failure to Work. I got interested in failure, uh, not because I wanted to be an expert in failure, although certainly I, like most of us, have had my experience with that, but because I think failure is such a critical dance partner to innovation. And if, you, if you're serious about innovation, you've gotta be willing to dance with the partner so that was a book that we wrote to try to help people put this resource of failure to work. And then more recently with one of my Princeton colleagues, Chris Keeney, uh, we wrote a book called Built for Growth, which is really to try to decode the personality characteristics of highly successful entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. Because our interest, as the title suggests, is probably the number one agenda of most organizations, which is how do they grow? But forget all that. If you're a fan of TED Talks or you're a fan of TED, uh, I'm the guy that came up with the idea for TED U, TED University, which has become a pretty popular part of the TED conferences when people get back to meeting face to face, at least. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about a couple of themes today. Um, part of his mindset, some of it's about skill set, but a lot of it is what, about what I've nicknamed will set. In other words, how do you put these new ideas into play? offensively and defensively, whether you're an incumbent or an insurgent. And along the way, I'm gonna offer a few kind of sideline observations and perhaps some suggestions for you in terms of how you might approach this new, what I call eality, this, this environmental, economic, but above all, above all, this, this notion of virtual connection, of electronic connections. So. Let's start. Uh, and by the way, you're going to know the difference between my points and some of my supporting activities just by these small little letters. So keep track. I think we go to N, if I remember correctly. Uh, but so you'll get a chance to know where we are. So don't stay in love with your strategy or products for too long. 
their half-life's never been shorter. And I'm, I'm going to flag half-life. I'm not going to call it an analogy yet because it's only a half analogy. Let's think about this. Everybody, everybody is trying to find competitive advantage. But I want you to think about competitive advantage in this new world as if it were that head of lettuce that you bought at the grocery store yesterday. Because just like that head of lettuce, the competitive advantage is going to go sour. It's going to get stale very, very quickly. Second, know the enemy that you're up against. What's the enemy? Very simply, I don't care what business you're in, what technology you're involved in, what industry you serve, you're up against one gigantic obstacle, and it's the status quo. Think about it. The world's getting along just fine without what you want to do to improve it. Your organization is moving along at a pace that it's quite comfortable with, presumably. The status quo is an enormous, an enormous competitor for all of us. And it's an unfair fight. It's not that it's not a it's not an even deal. We're trying to basically get big organizations, small organizations to think and behave fundamentally differently, using a technology, using a way of thinking that is novel for most of them. Now, if you doubt that, I just want you to think about the experience that we've had with another technological revolution. It took us almost a century before the, this revolution made any kind of commercial success at all. Think about that. Just think about that in terms of the power of the status quo that you're up against. Now, next, The Innovator's Dilemma, spectacular book, landmark book in the field of business strategy, but it's a book. It's not an effective strategy if you're an incumbent. Let me give you some observations that I've seen about working with large organizations and seeing other organizations about how they deal with this new reality, this new world of digital. Now, stage one, they usually try to find some sand. Step two, insert their head. Step three, hope it'll all go away. Now that's one step, that's one approach. Stage two for a lot of these organizations is a little different. Stage two is kind of something like panic. Oh my God, the world's falling, what do we do? And I don't know about you, and I, this is an American uh, example, but I've always been struck when I look at this Munch painting about the similarity between that and the electricity outlets in the United States. <clears throat> Maybe that has something to do with plugging in or connectivity, I'm not quite sure which. Then we get to stage three. Stage three, let's make it a project. We must go digital. We need a digitization project. Who do we find? What can we do? How can we get moving here? And suddenly, if you're lucky, maybe you get to stage four in this process. Stage four is we've gone beyond project and now we're in a full scale program. We've got lots of people working on various dimensions of digital revolution, digital transformation. If that is the reservoir of your strategy, if that's the repertoire you're using, you're playing a losing game because your organization is probably addicted, and I mean that term literally, addicted to the status quo. You may need to go cold turkey. And let me give you an idea about cold turkey from other addiction experiences. Think about the DTs. Now, you probably know what the DTs are, right? Delirium tremens. It's an after effect of withdrawing from alcohol. Why am I mentioning that? Well, let me substitute a few words here. Let's think about digital tremens. As you withdraw from pre-digital standard operating procedures, and you kind of know the symptoms here, right? It may not be three days, maybe it's three months after you begin to withdraw, and maybe it doesn't last for two or three days, it lasts for two or three years. The symptoms continue. The organization shakes, shiver, they've got an irregular heartbeat, they're sweating, they're not sure, they're nervous, they're anxious. And then maybe, maybe you'll even see that they start to hallucinate. They imagine a different world. They think they're in a different time zone. They don't believe that they're in the world that they're in. Today's too late. 
I want you to come with me on a quick thought experiment. Let's imagine for the moment that your organization has a lovely brand. You've got a workplace that people really like. You've got positioning in an industry that your competitors envy. Strong business model, great culture. And you've even built a reputation yourself as a disruptive innovator. Congratulations. You've got good company. You've got companies like Blockbuster, Toys R Us, Sears, wonderful organizations, all of which missed the boat. Why? What was going on? Think about it. Apple computer probably should never have existed. Sony had design, Sony had technology, Sony had music that was portable, Sony had great brand. What happened? Amazon shouldn't have existed. Sears was the retail revolution. They created the new business model. They figured out how to get everything to everybody, regardless of where you were located. But they too missed the boat. The problem is that these organizations saw their future as being more or less an extrapolation of what their past were. They looked ahead and they saw a road that was pretty familiar. And maybe they thought it might be five or 10% better than the traditional road or five or 10% worse. But they traveled down what I've sort of come to nickname the Mobau Road. Now, Mobau is not a small village in Austria or Germany. It stands for more or less business as usual. And I think that's the trap that many organizations, particularly incumbent organizations, large established firms, get trapped into thinking they're traveling on. Are you traveling on the mobile road? Next, and this one's probably the most important one I want you to keep in mind. Think eality, or if you don't like that term, maybe try electricity, or if you don't like that one, try virtuality. What I mean to suggest is that this digital revolution is as pervasive, as important, as powerful, as indispensable as electricity was. If you are thinking about running your business without electricity, you probably don't have much of a business. You're gonna to have to think about your organization, whether it's an incumbent or an insurgent, digitizing just as pervasively, just as powerfully, just as totally saturationally as being powered by digital in the same way you think about electricity. So think about this connection between electricity and digitization. I think it is that important. Now, I often ask both in classes and clients that I work with this, this very simple question, what would fill in the blank do in this situation? What would Thomas Edison do if he were facing the digital revolution? I think he might be doing a couple of things. First of all, he would be tying together technology and business models. He would be thinking about not just how we make something happen, but how we commercialize that new potential. How could we put together new configurations based on this new technological capability that could change how we think about business, how we create industries. That's one of the things that Edison was so terrific at, integrating technology and business models. I hate to tell you, but your customers, if you're an incumbent organization, have already been hijacked. You just don't know it yet. Now, you know the usual suspects here, right? There are many, many more than just these four. But I want you to think about the business of these organizations because they don't care about your brand. They want their brand to be the primary connection with your customers. Whether you are searching for things, whether you are looking for things, whether you're shopping for things, whether you're enjoying things, whether you're trying to connect with friends or associates, 
they are going to take you and your relationship with your customers and move it to the side. Thank you very much. That's their customer now. You become a commodity on their platforms. That's difficult to accept. But unless your business has the same kind of intimate connection and widespread access to the customers that you are serving today, beware because you're likely to compete with these people. These are the organizations that are shaping customer expectations. These are the organizations, and in your own life, you probably have your own expectations as a consumer being formed and shaped by how you shop or interact with these kinds of organizations. Do they know who you are? Yes. Do they know what you like? Yes. Are they shy about suggesting new things that you might like? No. Will they connect you with other opportunities that might be similar to the things you're primarily interested in? Yeah. Do they offer you great, almost effortless customer experience? In most cases, yes. How do you answer all those questions? Apps, eat physical products, and even buildings for lunch. Just think about FinTech as one small example. And these are just the 250 latest companies in FinTech. And just imagine you're a poor traditional bank like Wells Fargo. Where do you go? What is it you do? How can you protect yourself? Where do you go for new value? How are you gonna keep your customers? What's gonna be your new product line? All of those issues are being redefined in fundamental ways, not by your traditional competitors, but by these new swarming competitors, FinTech competitors, most of which are natively digital. So I'll borrow a hymn from Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy. Figure out how your business can appify, how your business can become more app friendly. Can you give your services? Can you deliver your products? Can you connect with your customers in ways that are much more like an app would than a physical product has traditionally? Now, we're all living through this one. And I do not in any way want to minimize the tragedy that we are all experiencing worldwide. But the fact of the matter is, from a business and technological point of view, COVID has really hit the kind of fast forward button to a very significant degree. It's brought together both necessity on the one hand and opportunity. And if you think about it, where we work, how we shop, collaborate, connect with one another, how we try to learn, or in my case, try to teach, where we get healthcare, how we get healthcare, how we eat food, how we buy food, all of these things have fundamentally changed. Most, not just temporarily, I think. What does that open up for us as an insurgent? Enormous opportunities, a brand new landscape of possibilities created out of this digital potential. And if we're incumbents, we've got to figure out how we rearrange things very, very quickly in order to be able to accommodate what at the very least are going to be hybrid mechanisms to deliver these fundamental basics, not just in our personal lives, but in our organizational affairs as well. The new game is, I'm gonna suggest, at least a triathlon. Now, traditional thinking about strategy in business formed by books like Discipline of Market Leaders or new ones like the one would suggest that it's all about focus. You gotta pick one thing. You can't try to be all things to all people. You can choose to be great as a product leader. You can choose to be operationally excellent. Or maybe you choose to be most intimate with your customers. Nobody knows customers better than you. And that's the traditional way of thinking about what you're gonna concentrate on. The problem is that if that's the game you're playing, it's yesterday's rules. You're thinking perhaps nationally rather than globally. You're thinking about physical products rather than digital. You're thinking not about 
new waves of possibilities, but old school. You're not moving fast enough. And above all, you're thinking about things rather than experiences and value. Let me suggest something different. There are companies now that are showing you can't afford to be just good at one of these things. You've got to be excellent at all three simultaneously. And there are companies that can show you what being in that royal zone of leadership look like. Some of them you're familiar with, some of them you may not be. And you probably have your own candidates for companies that are doing all three of these things extraordinarily well. But let me go back to this WWD question. Think about Google for a second. What would Google do in your situation? How would they think about the strategic situation that your company or your organization is in? I'm gonna suggest one word to you that is probably the scariest word in at least the business vocabulary. And that's free, free. Did any of you happen to get your payment from Google last week? Your check, your electronic transfer from Google? I don't, can't see anybody's hands being raised, but I'm assuming nobody got any money from Google last week. Just think about that, the power of that digital business model. They figured out a way in which most of the world, with the exception of parts of China and much of North Korea, presumably, work for Google. Our searches, our mashups, our use of their products, they figured out a way to give us for free, but make their cash registers ring. It's a pretty extraordinarily powerful model for as long as it lasts. So think about how you might exist in a digital competitive marketplace if you had to give away your products or services. How might you create value in different ways? How might you make your own cash register ring? Or let me suggest an organization that most of you may not be familiar with. It's the US Automobile Association. Think of um, the AAA for military officers. The reason I suggest USAA as a company worth looking at is because it enjoys some of the highest customer satisfaction of any organization in the American economic landscape. Its members, and that's the way they feel, they are members of the organization, feel intensely loyal to this firm. This has become one of the most diversified and successful financial services enterprise in the United States. How they do what they do, how they blend personal service with digital capability is a model well worth looking to. So next, <clears throat> how can you harness what I'm gonna call the farmer's superpower, if you're an entrepreneur, to accelerate the pace of your business? Now, it may seem odd to think about the comparison between entrepreneurs on the one hand and farmers on the other, but I got curious about this. As I teach here in Silicon Valley, a lot of people come from around the world and say, gee, what's the secret of Silicon Valley? How is it that it became so powerful so quickly? How can it be this hotbed of innovation and entrepreneurial enthusiasm? And I got to thinking about, well, where else does magic happen? And it occurred to me that <clears throat> magic happens in farmers' fields and in gardens all over the world. And I got thinking more about that. I said, well, what is it about that? What, what's the magic there? And one of the key ingredients is this natural magic of photosynthesis. This ability to take dirt and seeds and water and air and fertilizer, and through the magic of photosynthesis, convert it into crops or flowers. And I asked myself, well, wait a second, is there a secret power <clears throat> that entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs in places like Silicon Valley, have been able to develop? And I borrowed a word and adapted it to this situation. Entrepreneurs, when they're doing great things, aren't in the business of photosynthesis, but they are in the business of protosynthesis. Protosynthesis. What's that? Protosynthesis is basically the ability to very rapidly convert an idea 
into a market testable prototype. That's what Silicon Valley does so well. That's what other places around the world that have become hotbeds of entrepreneurial initiative do so well. Creative collisions, fast paced ideas to prototypes, a willingness to tolerate failure, a willingness to know that failure is the next step to innovation in many cases. How do you convert? How rapidly in your organization can you convert ideas to market testable, customer testable prototypes? That's one of the capabilities that digitization begins to open up for you. Now, this one comes all the way full circle. Think of your business as recombinant DNA. Recombinant DNA. What do I mean by that? Well, let me go to another usual suspect here. What would Amazon do? One of the things that I think Jeff Bezos has done so extraordinarily well in his career with Amazon is he never falls in love with any particular strategy or product that Amazon brings to market. He's constantly, and his people are constantly trying to reconfigure things, looking at things from different angles. It's almost as if they have a, an infinite set of Lego blocks and they're reconstructing them into different configurations all the time. But the biggest example, and probably the best example of corporate innovation, organic innovation in the last generation, is Amazon Web Services. And just think about what that represented. This is essentially Amazon taking what might have otherwise been a gigantic cost center alone, its network of web servers, its network of capacity, and turning it into one of the most successful businesses around. That's extraordinary, but it's also a, an insight and an approach to the digitization of your business that is potentially available to you if you're an incumbent or a potential target of someone else's business if you happen to be an insurgent. Now, what's all this mean to your org chart, to your traditional way of doing things, making decisions, hiring? Let me suggest that it may be time to rewire or rehire your org chart to deal with this new reality that we're all in the middle of. And if you had to start one place and one place only, I would suggest you start with customer experience. Hire people who know, care about, focus on, are capable of designing, engineering, and delivering customer experiences that are consistent with those expectations that are being shaped by the digital giants of the world today. Customer experience, because more than your products, more than your services, it is ultimately the relationships that you are able to establish and sustain and protect with your own customers that is probably going to be your best answer to the kind of digital DNA that your company is going to need to succeed in the next generation. And I'll close with Apple as the example. Think about how Apple approaches design. And I don't mean just design of beautiful products or fancy technology or great stores. No. I mean, think about how Apple considers the customer experience. When you open a product, when you start to use it, think about the ease with which they make that possible how convenient it is, how in some cases effortless it can be, how intuitive it feels. That's the work of customer experience fanaticism, of design excellence. And I'm not suggesting that your business necessarily needs to design beautiful physical products at all. What I'm suggesting is a state of mind and a will to think about your own customer's expectations the possibilities of transforming them and defining them in a particularly distinctive way based on how you create a digital 
experience for your customers. Now, I started with the big analogy that this is a new form of DNA. It's the twin strands of identity and digitization built around the two fundamental objectives of any business organization. How do I create value? And how do I protect the value once created? But I wanna leave you with one other thought because it's worrying to me. And I just wanted to share my worry. It has to do with this identity and the interplay with digitization. Digitization is a force multiplier of identity, but it can take us in two contradictory dimension, dimensions and directions, I think. On the one hand, it exercises an almost centripetal force. It tends to bring us together. It connects us in very powerful ways, many of which we hadn't anticipated. But at the same time, it exerts a kind of centrifugal force. It pushes us apart from one another. And as you contemplate your own organization's digital strategy, keep in mind the ultimate values that your use of digital technology, digital business models is creating. Because if all that we're gonna get out of this is a world where we are kind of the connected disconnected, are we really much better off than we are today? And it always seems to me that a digital campfire is not quite as comforting, not quite as human an experience as what most of us crave for. So I hope some of these ideas, some of these suggestions help you as you think about this new domain we're in the middle of. What's interesting about it and what's exciting about it to me is that it has the same kind of opportunity that electricity did 100 years ago. This is that powerful. This is that pervasive. And this is that possible. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, John. That was fascinating. I think uh, we were all listening. And I would say that if we were in a real room, we would have a for sure long round of applause. And thank you so much. That was really inspiring. And um, we now have um, uh, a bit of time to take some questions. So I encourage participants to uh, have their questions. I start with one of the questions that we have. And I have actually many, so <laughs> I'll, I'll also hope to uh, exploit a bit my position to, to ask a couple of my questions as well. <laughs> so I start with uh, Eva. So Eva asks, do you see the rise of personalization impacting the status quo across industries? And then she follows, how should incumbents or insurgents respond to the privacy paradox that accompanies the rise of personalization? Yeah, it's, it's an enormously <clears throat> important question. Thank you, Eva. Um, <clears throat> first of all, personalization is, I think, becoming table stakes uh, in most businesses. And by table stakes, I mean that it's kind of the necessary but not sufficient price of entry and success uh, in most situations. You can have um, companies like Amazon and Alibaba and Baidu and, and, and others to, uh, to blame for that. But it's also become part of what I think most of us expect um, from our interactions with most organizations, that they at the very least remember my name. <laughs> uh, at the very least, they remember what previous transactions I've had with them. Um, that's, that's, that's bare bones, <clears throat> but beyond that, um, you begin to get into the zone that you flag with your question, and that is privacy concerns and big brother issues. Uh, how much should they know about who I am and what I do and what I buy and what I'm interested in? Uh, and what should they do with that information once they do know it? To me, the key issue there is consent and transparency. Um, I think most digital businesses are going to need to simplify so that, mo so that people can begin to understand the terms of service. 
so that when we consent to our information being owned and shared by somebody other than ourselves, we're a bit more aware of that, number one. Number two, I think it's incumbent on the, on the business to be extraordinarily transparent about how it uses the information that it collects about each of us. And in one of my earlier slides, I put, I had Facebook there. I'll tell you, I think Facebook is an example of perhaps how not to do this because the entire Facebook enterprise, I would argue, depends on one thing and one thing only, and that is trust. And once you begin to lose the trust you have with your audience, with your customer base, you can begin to unravel <clears throat> your empire very, very quickly. So I think trust is at the, at the center of this. It's the reason I say consent and transparency are the two issues that I look for uh, the most. Does anybody do it right yet? No, I think we're all fumbling around in this space. I think governments are, I think businesses are, and I think to some extent, all of us as individual consumers are trying to figure out what are the rules of the game here? How much information am I okay with other people knowing? And on the one hand, I like it because it makes my life easier if it's being used in an ethical principled way. But on the other, I'm apprehensive about it because it can be used to discriminate. It can be used to, uh, to stereotype and it can be used to abuse. So the privacy issue is enormous, um, but, but my best suggestion to you is focus on this twin questions of consent on the one hand and transparency on the other. Thank you very much for, for this answer. Uh, I go with, with the, a few questions. We can have them as quick shots if you want, <laughs> so that we, we kind of can uh, touch different uh, parts of, um, uh, uh, of your presentation before. So um, that's just, uh, I mean, out of prediction and just as a thought exercise. So because, of course, you mentioned the pandemic, because when you were speaking, I was like, oh, yeah, I would actually ask him uh, how did the pandemic accelerate all this? But of course you mentioned that. So what, what do you think would have happened without the pandemic? Would have taken this 100 year as for <laughs> the innovation you were talking about to get here? No, I don't think so. Um, although, <laughs> although, you know, technology predictions is a hazardous, hazardous uh, occupation. Um, the, I, I look at uh, I, I look at cell phone adoption um, as an indication. Um, you know, no technology has been accepted more rapidly in world history than than cellular technology has been, and that's become obviously foundational to all the rest of the connectivity that that we all are experiencing. Um, I mean, it, it, all the predictions for the Internet of Things, it's almost going to be, and I think it will be, that the Internet of Things is far greater than the Internet of People, um, you know, very, very quickly, uh, if not already. Um, the, the pace is something that I think is accelerating. It's not slowing down. But I think, as I suggested, I think what the pandemic has done is it's compressed what was already a rapid um, explosion of technology diffusion. Um, it's, it's compressed it and accelerated at the same time. What's not happened, however, though, is I don't think that it has necessarily um, broken open the dogma within many large organizations about the imperative of getting digital immediately. I think, I think too many organizations are still struggling with trying to answer the question, should we, how do we, can we, as opposed to we must. And that, I think, that verdict is still outstanding for too many organizations. Yeah, and uh, there's also, I would say, another concern um, about the extent of uh, digitization, especially it's uh, really global dimension or not. So I noticed when you um, uh, projected the uh, uh, map of the globe with your consultancy work that you did some consultancy work also in some countries in Africa or in other countries which maybe are not as developed as Silicon Valley. <laughs> So um, there's this concern that the uh, spread of these digital technologies is actually uh, 
making the gap of inequalities around the world uh, bigger. So um, how how big this will be like what's your take on that like what's your also given your field experience i would say of your consultancy work it's a it's an enormous issue um and it's a moral issue uh, as well as a, as well as a business and technological question um my own feelings you know people characterize this in different terms but you you could almost think about the industrial revolution was fundamentally about a revolution of how we make things right um, the information revolution is in some ways um, you know how we make decisions uh, in organizations uh, how how we how we leverage information to inform uh, literally to inform our our decision making but I think the next huge revolution is going to have to be the inclusion revolution for the reasons that you point out uh, Marta, the the question of, of the fairness with which the the possibilities that digitization makes possible are shared uh, around the around the world. What I'm optimistic about is that the very power and flexibility of uh, digital technologies makes it possible for leapfrog innovations to happen from the bottom up rather than from the top down. Um, you know, everybody's familiar with the term disruptive innovation, right? Everybody loves to talk about it and think that that's what their organization's about. I actually think that for most organizations and maybe for us as a society, the, the notion of eruptive innovation is much more powerful. How can we encourage bottoms up, effervescent kind of innovation happening around the world? And I think, going back to my cellular example, um, I think it's it's tremendously encouraging that the the real innovation that that allowed people to start paying bills with their cell phones didn't happen in the developed world. You know, it happened in Kenya. Uh, it started there with M-Pesa. Uh, that that's the those are the folks that showed the rest of the world how this could be done. And I think those kinds of possibilities uh, abound, but it's going to call it's going to call on all of us i think from in the developed world to make sure that the that the technologies and services that we're making possible are shared using the efficiencies and economies of scale that digitization makes possible and on the other hand from an educational point of view and from a technology access point of view that we make very sure that this is not just the the playground of the privileged I think this is the this is the playground of possibilities for our posterity uh, as a as a human as a human race. I think it's uh, it's something that to wish for, especially now with the pandemic. Because if we think about all the discussion about the distribution of the vaccines, <laughs> we should also speak about distribution of technology in this sense. Now, so let's let's see what happens. But I really hope that things will go as you were saying, like this inclusion <laughs> revolution. So I'll take um, some questions from the audience. Um, I mean, I would have 1,000 questions for you, but I can't <laughs> really exploit too much. My... We'll, have to, we'll have to wait till we rendezvous in Italy the next time. <laughs> exactly, exactly, as soon as possible. So um, someone is asking, trust is an incredibly interesting concept in the digital world, particularly considering the surges of fake news in times of COVID. How do you think young, big, young businesses can build their credibility and spread trust in their tech innovations? You know, trust is um, one of the great elusive uh, indispensables of almost all organizations and almost all relationships, uh, obviously. Um, you know, I think we can make it much more difficult than it is. I think in the case of trust, it's going back to some very, very basic concepts that, that you can embrace and employ and exemplify starting with your very first employee because culture in a company is created <laughs> with the first employee um, and, it, and it simply builds from that. But you have to have a culture internally first and foremost that is based on honesty and candor. Um, one of the reasons why we or my colleague and I were so interested in writing the book on failure is because failure is one of the great taboos in most organizations. 
you know, think about it. All of us are human beings. All organizations are fallible. All people are fallible. But in most organizations, it's very hard to share that fallibility. It's very, very hard to, to share that fundamental notion of humility that comes with the knowing that we're all going to make mistakes. So I think trust starts there. It starts with the candor with which you and your colleagues in your own organization can honestly talk about what you're doing, what you're learning, what mistakes you're making, and then carry that forward in your dealings with your suppliers and your customers and your investors. Because honesty is a, a, goes a long way to establishing trust. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you aren't entitled to put the, the, the right, the best, most positive interpretation on circumstances, but you don't want to kid yourself. And above all, you don't want to mislead yourself or others. Because trust, as elusive as it is, as difficult as it is to build, it's extraordinarily fragile and easy to lose. It's easy to have a brand tarnished quickly if it starts to lose trust and extraordinarily difficult to rebuild it. So I would treat it with the same care and attention that is, I think, behind your question. It is one of those crown jewels that every organization has the ability to create, but you need to preserve it and protect it because it is that powerful. It is that precious. Thanks, John. And uh, I would say, uh, I, I think I mentioned I teach ethics. So I, I would say that your answer just reinforced one idea that I'm trying to work on, which is that the, the technological evolution is actually forcing us to be even more human and to actually invest on those virtues that you mentioned. <laughs> and uh, because human wisdom and uh, human virtues can't really be automated while we can leave this all to technology. So. I, I thank these participants for, for the question. And uh, we have a couple of questions more. I think we have just eight minutes and I will have Molly stopping us. So <laughs> I think we can answer them both <laughs> if, if, if you want. So the first is about what would you say uh, are the main hindrances of go in going digital, particularly for established, more traditional companies? First, a sense of urgency. And second, a commitment to do it. Um, and both are both are essential, I think. Um, what I was suggesting earlier is that many organizations approach this either as something that they hope to be able to postpone or they think they can deal with on a fairly isolated project by project. Let's do an initiative. Let's let's you know tackle this part of the business or that part of the business. I think it's much more powerful than that and much more urgent than that. Um, I think this is something, and, and the analogy you know, I'd, I'd wanna leave you with is electricity. You know, can you imagine any aspect of your business operating effectively on any level, but particularly on a global level, <laughs> if it weren't electrified? Well, guess what? That's the way I think you need to be thinking about digitization. Uh, it needs to be thought about in every nook and cranny, in every process, in every procedure, in every org chart, and indeed, to some extent, almost in every job. How can we utilize the capability of digitization to improve our ability to deliver and create value in society and for the customers that we serve? It is, it is that fundamental. Uh, it's not a nice to have. It's a must have. It's not something that gets added onto an organization. It's something that needs to transform the organization itself. And it's why I suggested early on that it's the play in that DNA between digitization and identity. I didn't say strategy by itself. I didn't say marketing. I didn't say manufacturing or finance. No, it's identity. It's that core to, I think, the future success of most organizations. So I go with the next question. It's about more the generational, I would say, issues related to the adoption of technologies. So this person says, John, wonderful talk. A key constant of many of these tech companies is uh, the youth age of those they employ. And this is similar to many of the marketing companies they employ. The digital world appeals a uh, youth world, but 
this I feel is looking out is losing out on the experiences and knowledge of older generations. Now we are almost tech friendly. Do you think companies will try more to engage with and employ these older generations, given their experiences and span power for a start? Well, I wouldn't look the way I look if I didn't have a point of view on that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me say that, that, that I hope, I certainly hope that's the case. I'm not especially optimistic, though, uh, about that. Um, I have three sons. Um, one of them works at Google. One of them works at Apple. Uh, and the other works for a, for a, um, a global nonprofit in the, in the water um, arena. Um, I have enormous respect. And I teach young people <laughs> you know, all the time in addition to, to other things that I do. So I have enormous respect um, and, and hope for what younger people are doing in this space. And you know, like, like any uh, revolution, um, you know, some people need to stand aside and make room. Uh, for different ideas and approaches, but I think I think there also in this case are amazing opportunities available that digitization makes possible for older people and and people who are uh, who are otherwise marginalized for different reasons. Um, I'll just give you obviously we know about what we can do for for physically handicapped people with digitization in ways that people have not been able to think about before. Even, even um, providing therapy services um, you know, remotely are, are changing people's lives for the better. But I'll give you just one vignette from, um, from my teaching that surprised me. Um, and I think it has implications potentially regardless of age. And that is there's something about this Zoom world of interaction, whether we're in team meetings or Google Meet, whatever, or Zoom. Um, and that is that it, I think it opens up possibilities for introverts to participate in, in, in activities more than many of our traditional mechanisms uh, would otherwise encourage and, and, and welcome them to in our normal face-to-face -face interactions in organizations. I've noticed it in classrooms um, that shyer people, more introverted people are more comfortable stepping in in this virtual environment. And if that's true, I think that's enormously powerful and, 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 and wonderful, to, wonderful to contemplate because we're getting access to what's going on between the ears of so many more people than we otherwise could with traditional business processes, meetings, how we run meetings, how we run classes. So to that extent, I think age is irrelevant, um, but uh, I don't keep my breath, I'm not holding my breath for uh, major tech companies suddenly opening the doors for people over 40. <laughs> I, think that's un I think that's unlikely. <laughs> Thank you for the answers. I absolutely share what you said about the use of technologies uh, for more introvert people. I found it uh, true for the class environment as well. So, so we have another question. Uh, if you think we can answer it quickly, I'll take it from Tommy. Do you have names for different groups of consumers of information? For example, top class or there's a... You know, there's so many of them. Um... <laughs> The short answer is no, uh, and here's why. I'm not trying to dodge it, but um, what I actually think is more intriguing and more powerful is for companies to come up with their own lexicon. Because if they don't start with a framework, they're gonna have to learn about one and they're gonna have to create one that is relevant to their own organization, their own industry, their own groups of customers. And I'd much rather have a company embark on that voyage of discovery into this unknown space of who are these people out there? How, what kind of digital experiences are they looking for? What kind of information uh, do they need? I would much rather have a company, you know, shine a flashlight into that dark space and learn for themselves what they're gonna discover and then put labels on it that are unique to them. Thanks for, thanks for taking this question. Um, uh, and yeah, and right, really interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, I agree with Anne. Uh, that's that's uh, this hour was particularly insightful. I have one last question, but it's very quick. Shall we expect a new book, John? 
I, I don't know. Uh, the, the, certainly more more blogs and, and talks. I don't know about yeah. books yet. <laughs> Actually, I encourage all the participants to check out um, uh, John's uh, personal website because there's a lot there about uh, his activity as a speaker. So you can find there his videos uh, and uh, his books and uh, everything is there and also a way to be in touch with him in case you have more questions for him. So John, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. I would say that I would have preferred to meet you in person and in Italy, as you were saying, <laughs> instead of on Zoom, but it's fine. We, we, we can make it in the future. <laughs> we can make it happen in the future. And uh, I also thank Molly for Cordy and um, Antonia for coordinating uh, the uh, technical aspects of uh, our webinar this afternoon. And uh, Get Digital doesn't finish now, so stay tuned because the next uh, speaker is on at uh, 3.45 p.m. Dublin time. And there will be uh, Josh Holmes from Microsoft. And uh, but my final words is a big thank you for all the analogies and uh, all the uh, content and wisdom that we heard from John this afternoon yeah. together. Thank you so much. Bye, John. Thank you.